Hi, everybody. It's Dean Cohen, and I'm uh, delighted to welcome you to another one in our series of conversations. Uh, our guest today is Richard Haas. Uh, uh, Dr. Haas is the now in his 18th year as the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, someone with an extraordinary range of diplomatic and government experience. He served in the early 2000s as the director of the policy planning staff at the State Department. Uh, and then from 89 to 93, he was a special assistant to President George H.W. Bush um, and served as the senior director for Near East and South Asia. He's uh, served in the, uh, other positions in the State Department, the Defense Department, uh, special coordinator with ambassadorial rank for uh, Northern Ireland, uh, the author of 14 books, graduate of Oberlin and uh, Oxford and a friend of long standing. Uh, so with that, uh, Richard, let me uh, welcome you and ask you to turn on your uh, video and unmute yourself. And uh, as always, uh, what I'm going to do is ask um, people to put questions into the Q&A. Uh, the way these work is the uh, my guest and I have a conversation for about half an hour or thereabouts. And then we move on to um, uh, Q and A from the audience. I privilege students, so uh, please identify yourself as a size student, um, and I'll be uh, filtering the questions later on. But first and foremost, Richard, welcome. Well, thank you. I like the introduction, particularly the last bit. Friend of long standing. I'll, uh, <laughs> everything else we could have done without, but that counts. Yeah, we go back quite a quite a way, quite a way till your to your Harvard days. So um, let's begin. What, what is the Council on Foreign Relations? I mean, it, tell us a bit about it. Tell us, and maybe if you would start a bit with its history and then as it's morphed, what, it, what it's become. Just to clear up, though, any misunderstanding, you said we go back to our Harvard days. I got rejected from Harvard. Uh, the only way I could have an affiliation was to, to teach there. So I just want to make that clear. I wasn't smart enough to get in. Uh, and I'm almost over I'm, it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to let that one drop. <laughs> <laughs> almost over it. Uh, it's a good day to ask about the Council on Foreign Relations. Maybe every day is a good day, but this year is our 100th anniversary. And so if you think back to where the country was a century ago, that's the roots of the, the Council. is the aftermath of World War I, uh, aftermath of a pandemic, uh, real concern about the U.S. role in the world. You had the uh, vicious debate that ultimately kept the United States out of uh, the League of Nations, ushering in uh, another 20 years of American disengagement from the world, also an era of growing protectionism. And the council was founded, and I use the word advisedly, by men in the Northeast, New York, basically the New York, Boston, Washington corridor. Uh, and the whole idea was to create an organization that would have a regular dialogue or a continuing conversation, in other words, about international relations and the relationship between the United States and the world. A year later, they started up a magazine called Foreign Affairs. And over the last century, the council has uh, taken on various missions. But the basic mission is still the same, to raise the quality of the debate, to be an idea source for Americans and others about foreign policy, about international relations. We have our own in-house think tank. Uh, I mentioned the magazine. We've got a couple of websites. Uh, we meet. Uh, we uh, in New York, Washington, and around the country over the last year, virtually, traditionally, uh, physically. And we're also increasingly an educational institution, not in the sense of yours. We don't issue degrees. We don't have students. But we are in high schools and colleges in all 50 states, over 100 countries around the world. And we produce everything from simulations of the National Security Council, what we call model diplomacy. And we've, we're just finishing an entire curriculum. We call it World 101 that's available for free for high schools and, and colleges to teach the fundamentals of international relations. And I think what makes us different is we're all these things, we're a membership organization, about 5,000 people are, are our members, is that we're genuinely nonpartisan. We're genuinely independent of the U.S. and other governments. And uh, it's our tradition to, to speak truth to power. Hmm. So, I, you know, I um, just think about that. Uh, you think about the people who founded 
uh, the councilman. That really was the old American foreign policy elite, as you say. It was the Boston, Wash- the, uh, Boston Washington corridor, more or less, but particularly New York, uh, international lawyers, bankers, finance people. Pretty small organization, I'm sure, compared with the uh, size of the membership today. Um, what difference does it make that it is, you know, a, as you say, a, not just a national, but in some ways a global organization with obviously a much more diverse group of people who are part of it. Now, what difference does that create? I think the big difference is that the council can now be a resource, not just for the people who are self-chosen to be part of the traditional foreign policy conversation, uh, the New York Times, the, you know, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the National Security Council, and so forth. But uh, increasingly, the council looks like America, so it's in a position to listen to from a, listen to America and speak to America. So we're our diversity. Uh, you know, we're probably now the membership is 35, 40 percent uh, women. Our younger members even even more so. Uh, diversity by every other uh, measure. So I think. Look, I think one of the lessons I take of the last few years, and I don't think you disagree with me, is we've learned that there are, there are fewer givens in American foreign policy than we had thought. And you and I grew up in an age where, you know, for most of our professional lives, you had the, the Cold War, at least for the early phases of it, and you woke up every day pretty much assuming a great deal. And then I think over the last four or five years in particular, we learned the hard way not to. And I think for the council, it's important to be part of that conversation, not just with those who buy into things, who think that the world is important, who think that foreign policy ought to be a priority. But I actually think the idea of having a diverse membership by every measure of the word diverse, including non expert <coughs> in some ways, uh, I think it makes us much more sensitive to what's going on in, in the conversation and in the country. So we're, uh, we're, less, we're less apart from the country than we, we used to. I mean, we put it another way, on one level, we're still talking to people like me and me, what you might call the foreign policy professionals at that level, but we've opened up an entirely different conversation with, uh, with big chunks of the, uh, of the country. And I think that is fundamentally different. I also think it's important, because uh, again, SICE is an exception. These are students uh, who have opted to go to SICE. Okay, but that means they're, they're, they're inside the tent. What about the millions of students who don't go to college or if they go to college, never take a course in international relations or foreign policy? How are they going to fulfill the, the, the obligation to be a, an informed citizen? And that's something that, I, that I'm wrestling with. Hmm. Um, I think I want to come back to some of those themes. Again, let me just uh, remind people to put questions into, uh, into the Q&A. Uh, and we'll be able to, to get to those. Uh, and I, I really do want to return to a number of those themes, including the Cold War theme, which I think is quite interesting. Let me ask, uh, you, you've, made, uh, you've made a number of splashes, uh, but one of the splashes that you made not that long ago, I think it was in the wake of January 6th, you, you said, okay, that's it. I am done with the Republican Party. Um, and... Uh, you know, it's one of a number of ways in which you and I are probably similar. Uh, and it seems to me that, you know, you're very much a representative of that, actually that old Council on Foreign Relations tradition. It's the, the Elihu Roots, the Henry Stimsons, uh, these kind of great figures from the early part of the 20th century who believed in a, a United States that would be outward looking and uh, international and that were uh, a, a breed that in many ways, no longer exists, the sort of liberal Republican Northeastern establishment. Could you say a, a little bit about that? Was that a, was it a decision that cost you any pain or just? You described me in a way that I expect to see my, my face on a postage stamp any day now as an endangered <laughs> species. Uh, well, we are. <laughs> <laughs> Moderate Republicans, internationalists. Now, look, I became a Republican around 1980 or 81, I, I was working in the Pentagon under the Carter administration. I'd worked for a Democratic senator before then, but for various reasons, uh, had moved more towards, away from that, uh, more t- in the direction of the center right. I lived through the uh, extreme phase of labor unionism in, in England, 
when I went to Oxford, it was the early 70s, the coal miner strikes, the Labour Party really got captured by the far, far left. It was, uh, and then you had the, ultimately the rise of Thatcher. And that was interesting. You had the Solzhenitsyn critique of the Soviet system. So, so for lots of reasons, and uh, also, uh, yeah, I found there, there were parts of what Reagan was saying that I found, uh, I, I found myself sympathetic to. So it was either 80 or 81 that I became uh, a Republican, felt closest out of all the presidents I've worked with uh, to President Bush, the father. He represented to me the kind of uh, internationalism. It was multilateral. Uh, he did believe in institutions, uh, and, but was also very careful with the use of force, was very careful about trying to promote democracy, uh, balancing it against other interests. So in many ways, uh, I was in a very similar uh, place. And then in subsequent years, I found the Republican Party got uh, much more ambitious in its foreign policy, and I was uncomfortable with that in terms of, uh, you know, as opposed to the Iraq war opposed to uh, other sorts of uh, ambitions in the world that I thought were too, went too far. I thought too much of a tendency towards unilateralism. And then you had the Trump years, which in many ways were the mirror image of that. Insufficiently internationalist, again, unilateral, uh, and critical of alliances and, and so forth. And then you know, January, I'd actually moved out of the party probably, it was last summer, around June or July, uh, what I saw was the growing illiberalism of the, the Re Republican Party. Uh, and January 6th, in some ways, was the culmination of all that uh, in terms of, uh, uh, I just thought people acting in ways uh, were inciting actions against American democracy. And what though also led me to leave the party is I, I lost confidence in the ability of the party to fix itself. And I would love to be wrong there. Good news is I'm wrong a lot, Elliot. Uh, if, um, but if the party could fix itself and once again be, a, if you want to call it an open tent and be a, a true center right party and so forth, uh, that would be a party I would be very comfortable with. I just lost confidence that this Republican Party, I won't say will ever get there, but would get there anytime soon, certainly not in, in, in the foreseeable future. And I just didn't feel comfortable. It was, look, this was, uh, I don't like being politically, you know, you know the, the, I'm not technically an independent. Uh, my son has taught me that, so I'm technically known as NPA, no party affiliation. Uh, and that's if you, because independents are, can be a party. So it basically means you're partyless. And parties are important vehicles in American politics. And they were important instruments over time. So they, I feel a bit orphaned politically. Yeah. There's some of what's going on now I like, but some of it is quite honestly, I'm uncomfortable with on the other side of the spectrum. I still see the, the hold of Trumpism over the Republican Party. So I feel a little bit that I'm out there in the ether. Yeah, well, um, trust me, I uh, feel your pain. I, um, I have to say, I don't know about you, I've found being a politically homeless person, which is what I am now, uh, it can be liberating in some ways. I mean, in that it allows you to rethink some of the things that uh, one always thought. Would you agree with that? Well, it frees you up from having to say, do I bite my tongue? Because even though I disagree with these people on these issues, because I support them on lots of other issues and I don't want to alienate them, uh, I have to hold back. Well, now you and I don't have to do that. Yeah. We're free to, uh, we can be equal opportunity alienators uh, <laughs> and speak our mind. And the, the discouraging thing is that there's, but politics happen at a collective level. And if you are without a party, there is a sense at times that you're a little bit uh, alone in the wilderness. And, I, I, and, and the, it's not quite sure how you, how do you act in ways that make a real difference? Yeah. How do you join forces with others in a ways that really can move the needle? And I'm not as confident as that as I used to be. Yeah, I'm with you, I guess. I mean, for me, it came with a certain kind of, um, even intellectual liberation, I suppose. But you know, I, I completely see what you're and agree with what you're saying. You, you resign yourself to a, a certain kind of loss of, of influence. Well, uh, so here's another splash that you made uh, 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 recently. Uh, so who would have thought the president of the Council on Foreign Relations would be out there, you know, making waves? It's a different world. Um, you said 
that it is time to end the policy of strategic ambiguity. Could you first explain what that means, sure. why it's, people might think it's a big deal to say that, and why you said it? Yeah, it goes back uh, over four decades, and it was when the United States uh, established a relationship with the People's Republic of China, and the United States and China reached certain understandings. But when you go back and read the record of Henry Kissinger's uh, conversations with Zhou Enlai uh, and the rest, uh, you realize how central from China's point of view the question of Taiwan was. And what happened then and since was a remarkable piece of statecraft. And again, you, you had an institution that studies statecraft. The finessing of the China-Taiwan-United States triangle is quite extraordinary. One of the things I always like to point out is that uh, it's wrong to think of foreign policy in terms of problems to be solved, but rather conditions to be managed. Well, this was a condition or a situation to be managed. And the United States and China essentially agreed to disagree. Uh, we said we agreed that there would be, there was one China, but uh, the question of Taiwan's ultimate uh, status and so forth was let out there. And our basic position was it couldn't be decided coercively. Whatever the ultimate relationship, whether Taiwan remained apart, whether Taiwan uh, was incorporated into China, it would have to happen voluntarily. And so we were against also uh, any Taiwan declaring independence, because that would be inconsistent with the one China idea, but we're obviously against the mainland using force to coercively uh, unify the country. And strategic ambiguity came in as the tool that we would use to help the finesse. So basically, to use a Middle East expression, it wasn't just final status that was left uncertain, but how it was going to be maintained. And what strategic ambiguity meant, the mainland, if it ever wanted to use force against Taiwan, could not be confident that we would not help Taiwan resist. And Taiwan, at the same time, could not be confident that if it were to declare independence, we would back it. So essentially, if either side moved dramatically to change the status quo, it couldn't be sure of what we would do or not do. And that's where the ambiguity concept came in. Okay, so, um, and then you, <coughs> you pop up and say, <laughs> the heck yes, with sir. that, junk it. And, uh, and presumably that also means actually extend a formal guarantee to Taiwan, yeah? Uh, it means, uh, basically I concluded that, well, even though something had worked, <coughs> excuse me, for 40 years, didn't mean it was gonna continue to work because certain conditions had changed. And what had really changed was Chinese capabilities had changed dramatically. Economic power being translated into military power. And Xi Jinping, uh, I concluded, as did many others who are much more of an expert than I am, I'm not, really represented a different kind of Chinese leader. And unlike Deng Xiaoping, who was dedicated to the idea of a stable exterior so China could develop, Xi Jinping essentially was saying, hey, this is our moment, we've arrived. And increasingly, rather than protecting a stable exterior, he's beginning to push against it, whether it's with India, whether it's with Japan, and again, with Taiwan, there's an impatience that has entered into Chinese foreign policy. And at the same time, I'm really not particularly worried about Taiwan independence. There's no serious move on Taiwan for that uh, now. So what I, what I argued with one of my colleagues in, a, in an article in Foreign Affairs is that we ought to go from ambiguity to clarity to tell the mainland, hey, if you use coercion, you should expect to be resisted. Now, we're not gonna tell you exactly how you'll be resisted. Uh, we need, at the same time, we would tell Taiwan, do not take this as license to do something reckless like declare independence. This is not an unconditional pledge. And I think what's most important beyond what we declare, quite honestly, is what we do. And whether you agree with me or not that strategic clarity adds to deterrence, what really matters is we've got to build up capability. Anytime in our business, and you know this better than I do, you've written about it profoundly, when there's a gap between capabilities and commitments, you're, you're, you're running a grave risk. And I fear that right now our commitments in Northeast Asia and our commitments to Taiwan under the Taiwan uh, Relations Act and also given how the Japanese and others would look at the United States not acting on behalf of Taiwan in a crisis, I'm worried that our commitments in many ways are outpacing our capabilities. So what I would hope is uh, this administration would take concrete steps 
to narrow that gap. And that's with or without a change in the rhetorical policy. Do, do you worry at all that uh, this could end up being a step closer to actually an open conflict with, well, presumably you'd think it wouldn't, it would be less likely to lead to open conflict with right. China. But, but I mean, surely you accept that it means that there's a significant chance that you could end up in an open conflict with China over Taiwan. Should we accept that risk? I mean, there, there are others. I mean, I think somebody, I think it's fair to say someone like Graham Allison basically says, look, you know, time to give up on Taiwan. We just can't protect them. Yeah, I profoundly disagree. Because I think if we do that, we also give up on our relationship with Japan and our relationship with South Korea. I think that's a game changer. Uh, so the, the commitment to Taiwan, Taiwan's significant. It's a thriving democracy. Uh, you know, the single most important chip manufacturer in, 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 in the world and so forth. 20 odd million people. But, but again, uh, I do like the credibility argument can get overdone, but I think actually here it applies. I think a lot of countries would recalibrate their foreign policies. I think if we weren't to act here, uh, it could have real implications for nuclear proliferation uh, around the world, uh, about real doubts about American uh, uh, guarantees. So I think there's an enormous amount at stake. But again, China is a calculating country. So what I think we, I'm a, look, anytime you institute deterrence, whether it was against the Soviets in Europe during the Cold War, or now here, there's a risk. There's a risk that your, blo- your pledge may get called. Okay, that's what deterrence is all about. <laughs> uh, it's not just rhetorical, but it is a commitment to act under certain circumstances. So you ought not to enter into it casually. But I would basically say is we're there. We're kidding ourselves if we think that somehow we're not already in the game. Uh, we are, and I think we ought to act accordingly. What I'm worried about actually much more than a black or white situation are gray area ones. And I can imagine the Chinese taking a leaf out of, say, Mr. Putin's book and looking at cyber or looking at ways of putting pressure on Taiwan. Uh, And then the question is, how do we act in those situations where it's not stark, but it's the buildup of pressure slight uh, reduction in Taiwan's autonomy. Autonomy. Those are the situations I think we ought to be preparing for uh, big time uh, right now. Yeah. Uh, for whatever it's worth, and not that it means much, I, I agree with you. I'm curious, do you think that our friends in the Biden administration agree with you? Whether well, or not they'll, they'll go whole hog, but that their basic assessment of the situation. I'm struck by a couple of things there. One is uh, their rhetoric is very muscular. And while they've not move formally to strategic clarity as opposed to ambiguity. Jake Sullivan the other day used the phrase clarity. They, their public statements about Taiwan have been extremely muscular. They have continued and even up the Trump administration policy of what you might call symbolic interactions with Taiwan officials and ambassadors around the uh, world, which by the way, I, I have real problems with. I think that's kind of poking the dragon in the eye. It's it's, it's potentially playing with fire to mix metaphors. It's, it's more symbolic than substantive, but, but I, but I uh, digress. But in general, I think there is something of a bipartisan view in this country about the challenge that China poses and that we have to meet it. And I should also say, when I testified the other day uh, in the House on uh, U.S. policy towards Asia, I was the least muscular person in the virtual room when it came to Taiwan. You had several congressmen talking about uh, recognizing Taiwan as an independent country, wanting to upgrade relations seriously. I don't go that. I don't go there. I think that would be a mistake. I think that ends any chance of a U.S.-Chinese relationship. I think it dramatically increases the chances of conflict. So I wouldn't go there. And it's not. I think it's neither wise nor necessary. But I do think I, I simply pointed out that there is considerable bipartisan support for a close U.S. relationship with Taiwan and a very tough U.S. relationship with the mainland. Interesting. Uh, one last question before I go to the uh, Q&A. And again, I would encourage people to, uh, to put questions there. Um, I have reserved the right to kind of hop around uh, the Q&A. So even if you're at the end of the queue, uh, I will, that doesn't mean that uh, you won't get to ask your question. Um, so something that you and I were discussing the other day, you and I are both products of essentially Cold War 
late Cold War educations. You were there as the Cold War came to an end, which a uh, fascinating time to, to be in government. But, but still, you know, I think you'd agree, our intellectual formation was very much that of the Cold War. And uh, I thought we might just reprise a bit the conversation we had. What are the things, you know, that really, what are the, what are the frames of reference, the modes of thought, which make no sense whatsoever, but what are the ones that might be worth uh, passing on to the next generation, which is going to be running things after all, for whom the Cold War is quite literally a matter of history rather than lived experience? Well, I'd love to hear your answer, so I'll answer it on the condition you answer your own question. Mm. One is that um, the first lesson I'd probably take away, want people to take away is that nothing's inevitable. The Cold War didn't have to stay cold, much less did it have to end on the terms it ended when it did. Um, that was the cumulative result of an awful lot of decisions and actions. It wasn't baked into the uh, cake. So, and it, it's reinforced by my, my own experience in government, having worked in four administrations, how much people, how much the people matter. There's very little that's, uh, that's uh, inevitable. Secondly, to me, it's a real uh, argument for American involvement in the world and leadership in the world. Good things just don't happen. It's not the natural state of things. It's like high school science. You're more likely to head towards entropy than order without the uh, United States. Cold War shows the value at the same time of uh, alliances. It was a collective uh, uh, effort. The, uh, it also shows the value of limited goals. Very early on in the Cold War, the United States rejected the idea of rollback. And I say that because in the last couple of years, including the former Secretary of State, the last Secretary of State for Mr. Trump, was talking about rollback of China, of the Chinese Communist Party. One of the reasons the Cold War stayed cold is there were certain ground rules. There were certain limits to what we did and, and how we did it. And it's one of the reasons the Cuban Missile Crisis didn't end in, in calamity and several other situations, the October 73 Middle East War did not. There were certain understandings, rules of the road, norms about the uh, Cold War. So I think there's, there's lots to look at and lots to learn. And the last thing is that it's not, though, it's also the dangers of overlearning from it. And I just say two things on that. One is that China is a very different kind of entity than, than the Soviet Union. And the real difference here is you've got a, a China that's an economic powerhouse and is economically integrated in the world. Whereas the Soviet Union essentially chose a path of autarky in, in uh, many ways economically. So to simply think you could take out your Cold War playbook and apply it now seems to me way wrong. And the larger point is I actually find the structure of the Cold War, the concentration of power in two systems, really an unhelpful framing for the world. I actually find a, a pre-World War I framing much more useful in terms of distributed power, uh, weak institutions, and, and a uh, kind of dynamism in the world and a, a certain lack of structure and predictability. So uh, in some ways, the, the Cold War, um, its structure was a little bit sui generis. And so I'm not sure that it can be, I think there's a danger in superimposing what worked then uh, in certain ways to, 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 to the present. And I apologize for going on so long. Mm. Uh, so I, I would agree with all those things. Actually, you stole some of my thunder. Uh, but I guess I would add um, three other things. First, the Cold War was waged on multiple fronts in, if you will, multiple campaigns. There was hot conflict. There was cold conflict. There was actually areas of cooperation. Uh, and I think it's really the, the competition between the United States and China, which is uh, going to go on and I believe is going to intensify because it's um, for a whole bunch of reasons uh, is similarly going to be conducted on multiple fronts in multiple, uh, multiple ways. Second thing to your point about alliances, that's absolutely right. And I think one of the things that we need to recover, which the Trump administration, you really had a feeling just didn't get at all is the centrality not only of alliances, but international institutions. And one of the reasons why the United States and its allies were successful 
um, was that there was this whole array of international institutions, which we helped build. I mean, this is one of the things I found most maddening about the last four or five years, people not acknowledging the fact that we had built these institutions and that you need to take a, pay attention to them. I mean, if one of the things that should be concerning is that the Chinese understand this very well. If you look at the, how active the Chinese have been in, say, at the UN and then kind of filling the bureaucracy there with their representatives, they understand the importance of it. The third thing I'd say where there, is, there are things we're thinking about is the, it, there is an ideological dimension to um, competition now. It is, it is different. I mean, you know, on the one hand, this, this, the Chinese Communist Party is not, uh, they're not communist. They're a certain kind of state capitalist. They, it is a Leninist party. And it is a party that's, that finds um, kind of liberal positions, free speech, you know, uh, the autonomy of the civil sphere deeply threatening, profoundly threatening to its hold on power. I think if there's one thing we've learned from Xi Jinping, it is that. And so there will be an ideological dimension which... Um, will be very important if somewhat different. On some of the things that are different, one, I completely agree with you, the, the grand simplicities of the Cold War no longer exist, although the Cold War was more complicated than we sometimes think. I'd say one thing that is um, profoundly different, uh, really two things. One is the late Cold War in particular was shaped by an aging Russian leadership. And I don't think that's what we're going to be dealing with with China. I think you're, the elites are quite different. But the other thing is the central issue, one of the central issues of the Cold War, which you and I cut our teeth on, was nuclear weapons. And, you know, it's hard to recapture now just how central, the, you know, the so-called strategic uh, nuclear balance was and arms control and so on. It, it just, I mean, in retrospect, it just looks goofy, Um but but that's no longer the case. I mean, there'll be other things that'll be out there. I, I would I would estimate that both of us probably devoted at least 25% of our career, a substitute for the word devoted might have been wasted, uh, counting warheads on launchers and INF agreements, uh, strategic agreements. And it, it's hard to imagine how much that became almost a proxy for global competition and really it, it sponged up an enormous amount of uh, attention and energy and in retrospect when you see the almost underneath the, a lot of that what was what was rotten at the core of the soviet system uh, how much we missed by this uh obsession with one or two manifestations of power so yeah and maybe that's the great lesson uh beware of strategic intellectual rabbit holes that you can go down and never really come out Okay, we have a lot of people who've asked uh, questions, so let me, um, and they're, they're going to come at you from all, all angles, but I know you can handle it. So first from uh, Professor Vikram Nehru uh, of, uh, of SAIS, um, how will the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan reshape alignments and power structures in South Asia? I'm not sure it will reshape them that much in in. South Asia, I, I'm against the withdrawal. Uh, let me just say that. But I think the power structure in South Asia, uh, you have Indian, Pakistani, uh, a, kind of a certain degree of structural animosity, which I think is probably, uh, to some point, can't be eliminated given their, their, their history. You've got um, India is going to be unhappy with what happens in Afghanistan. Pakistan may be momentarily okay, but I think over time it probably poses a threat to Pakistan, which would be one of the, a certain strategic irony after how much Pakistan has provided a sanctuary for the Taliban, whether ultimately Afghanistan provides something of a sanctuary for radical forces that uh, upset Pakistan. That would be the real question. And if I were going to, you know, I won't be around here to have to defend this speculation, but I think the real question is over the next, say, several decades. Uh, how does Pakistan fare? 
and Pakistan has powerful fault lines within the society and has divisions within its central government. And to me, the, the, the biggest question mark is what ultimately does Afghanistan mean for Pakistani, uh, for Pakistan's future? And I see it as a, uh, I, I see it as potentially extremely uh, troublesome. So that's to look at the Afghanistan in a South Asian context. So let, let me pick up some of the other questions, um, and I'm going to try to group them together. Could, could you explain why you were against withdrawing uh, forces from um, American forces from Afghanistan? I mean, given that there seemed to be, with a few exceptions, people like Dave Petraeus, uh, there was a kind of a giant heave of uh, relief at the departure. What, why were you opposed to it? Well, just to be clear, American withdrawal from Afghanistan will, for the time being, end American military involvement in Afghanistan. It will not end the war in Afghanistan. The war will continue. It will probably get worse, and it will bring about a, a likely Taliban takeover of much of the, uh, of much of the uh, country. Uh, I thought the withdrawal at this point was risking that outcome and the price we were paying for staying, I thought it'd become appropriately modest. And I don't mean to dismiss the sacrifice and the difficulty, but it was 2,500 American troops. We hadn't had a combat fatality for something like 14 or 15 uh, months. 99% you know, of the fighting was being done by Afghan uh, forces. Our presence also anchored an, an international presence three or four times the size of our own. So I thought it was a a relatively modest, affordable commitment for, an afford for a, a modest outcome. We weren't going to bring peace. We weren't going to bring military victory. But sometimes in foreign policy, you measure, not, you measure what you do, not against what you achieve, but against what you avoid. And I thought this was an, uh, an appropriate investment to avoid certain, uh, certain outcomes. And, I, and, I, and my view was it wasn't this was basically, when I argued to stay, it was an open-ended one. I thought that I didn't see the conditions coming about. When the president said the other day, he could never see the conditions under which we could withdraw. I agreed with that. I agree with that. If by that you meant either peace or military victory. So to me, the argument therefore was, was there a case to be made for staying in an open-ended fashion? And I thought, yes, yeah, so long as you could drive the cost of staying down compared to the potential cost of leaving. So that's why I came out where I did. Hey, but isn't this why uh, so many normal people get ticked off at uh, us foreign policy types? You know, you get up and say, yes, we want to um, kind of a protracted commitment, which won't actually really be successful and is pretty unsatisfactory. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can't tell you when it'll be done. That, and I mean, yeah. and I guess, that, I mean, in a way, the, the larger question that I want to put to you really, in a way, goes back to the founding of the council. That is to say, aren't, aren't there the ways that people like you and me think about foreign policy are really quite different, I think, from how normal, you know, political leaders, but even to some extent, the American people are normally inclined uh, to think about these things. And it, you know, on the surface of it, it just feels like, you know, what are you people telling me that, you know, 20 years of a war isn't enough, you want even more? And I know there haven't been casualties recently, but who knows that the, why there won't be any and, you know, why should, I, I, why should I we totally, do that? I totally get that. And you'd have to say, uh, look, I, I understand the argument. And, you know, but we've, we've kept forces in other places for a lot longer. And again, in order to avoid certain situations. Uh, and as long as we can keep the cost down, the hist history shows that the American people are willing to tolerate it. Look, the near-term benefits of leaving are, I get it. We save some money. We get 2,500 troops out of there. But what about the medium and long-term costs? No one's cap the advocates of withdrawal. I think are, are not even playing checkers, much less chess. They're not thinking at several moves down the road. So, but your larger point is exactly right. So when you do something like this, which is counterintuitive, another counterintuitive debate I've been involved with a lot over the last few weeks is why we should be shipping vaccines around the world at a time not every American's vaccinated. That's a counterintuitive debate. 
I think it's right. We should be. And to do it sequentially, I think, is bad for, bad for us as well as for others. So I think whenever you're going to advocate something that's counterintuitive, you have got to explain. Uh, you know, the other night people were doing comparisons between this president and FDR, and some people were talking about fireside chats. Well, yeah, let's take out the fireside chat. Let's talk and explain and let's connect the dots and say, here's why this matters. Here's the cost. Here's the benefit of what we'll derive from it. Here's what we're likely to avoid as a result of doing it. I mean, when Roosevelt used uh, the, Len, the fireside chat on Lend Lease and you Lend Your Navy Your Fire Hose, the hose when the house is on fire, that was, that to me is what in, uh, sometimes you've got to do in presidential leadership. You've got to explain it, uh, not for people who, are, who may go into SICE or majors in IR, but rather for people who don't see the connection between what's going on over there and here. But what, what better moment, Elliot, than now to do it? Here we are, half a million Americans have died from a virus that broke out in Wuhan, China. We're coming up against the 20th anniversary of 9-11 when 3,000 people died here in a day. You've got fires and floods and the rest linked to, to climate change. This is a moment where people ought to be able to connect the dots and say, here's why we're in the world. And yes, it costs a certain amount, but by the way, we get a pretty good return on investment. By the way, look at the last 75 years. What an amazing return on investment. We avoided great power conflict. Living standards rose dramatically. Lifespans uh, were uh, extended. Democracy spread. Not bad. Not bad at all. And so people are always going to be looking for the savings by doing less. And I think what leadership is about is explaining the risks and costs of doing less. It's the same argument we all have when we pay our insurance premium. We pay, we're willing to take some pain in order to prepare ourselves or position ourselves uh, against future uh, developments. You know, there's, uh, maybe there's another connection to our, World War, or our Cold War uh, discussion, rather. In the 40s and 50s, American political leaders knew they had to make a case to the American people. And why permanently stationing a, qu a quarter of a million, actually a third of a million American troops in Europe in peacetime you know, that would have been completely unthinkable at any other stage in American history. So they went out and made the case. By the time you and I were um, going to school, people sort of stopped making the case for those commitments. I mean, Reagan reignited some of the ideological fervor of the, um, of the Cold War, but the basic kind of structure of American commitments around the world and doing things that seemed to be open-ended people would stop making the argument. And um, I almost, sometimes I almost think that politicians forgot how to do it or that there was even a need to do it. Because at the end of the day, I mean, people like you and me are not going to convince most of the American people. This is up to political leadership. Uh, Let me make one other point if I could, because I agree with what you said. It also, if you want to win that argument, I think it, leaders have got to act responsibly. They can't afford big mistakes. And when I look at the last 75 years, we have made three, what I would call enormous, uh, we've made three momentous decisions that uh, are really questionable. One was going north of the 38th parallel in Korea after we liberated the South in 1950. Second's obviously Vietnam. The third is Iraq. And, if, and the lesson I take from these is if you want the American people to buy into your foreign policy, you have really got to be careful about overreach because the natural reaction to overreach, particularly unsuccessful overreach, and all three of these were, is underreach. And I think, uh, so, and I just take that as a, as a lesson, that to be a response, if you're, if you're playing the long game, you've got to be really careful about uh, getting overly ambitious at any point because you risk the long game. And I think that's what's happened here. Yeah, interesting. So uh, shift a little bit. Um, so the, there's a question from uh, Mark Merowitz about uh, your take on the, the news reports that Saudi Arabia and Iran are possibly working on rapprochement. But I, what I would like to do is ask, see if we could expand that a little bit to discuss uh, mi Middle East. And actually, let me proceed by saying, I mean, I, I was a pretty fierce critic of the Trump administration. Uh, you weren't all that pleased with them either. 
but can't you argue that actually their Middle East policy was pretty sensible? Uh, disengage as much as you can. You know, the Abraham Accords, okay, that was a UAE and Israeli initiative, particularly UAE initiative, but we brokered it. You know, we don't need the Middle East all that much anymore. Uh, so mm-hmm. actually what they were doing was pretty, pretty prudent. Uh, you, anyone could argue that. I'm not sure I'd agree with it. Uh, look, I think though they, coming back to what I just said, there was a widely held view that we had overreached in the Middle East. And by the way, strategy, the L.E. Cohen's of the future are going to look at the last 30 years, are going to scratch their head about how the Middle East became so central to America's purpose in the world after the end of the Cold War. Inconceivable that people will not understand how that ever could have uh, happened. So the idea of dialing down in the Middle East, I thought, was strategically warranted. I would have questioned you know, the wisdom of dialing up. But in any case, I think there was a case for dialing up. I think, the, I think the Trump administration took it to an extreme with one exception, or maybe two exceptions. One was they dialed down, uh, I thought, too much you know, with the Kurds. I thought that was uh, an unnecessary uh, thing. I think they dialed down too much on the Palestinian issue and ultimately uh, raised questions of Israel's future as a Jewish democratic country. I don't think they did Israel any favors in the, in the long run. I think the Abraham Accords were a step in the, uh, a welcome step in the, the right direction. And I think their, their treatment of Iran in the long run was not, uh, we isolated ourselves in some ways more than Iran. So I would not have, I was not a fan of the JCPOA, but nor was I a fan of unilateral exit. I would not have uh, advocated for, for uh, that. So I give them a mixed record uh, on, the, uh, on the Middle East. But I, I mean, and again, this looks doing a little bit of a retrospective. It, you know, it is striking how much, you know, money and blood and effort we've poured into the Persian Gulf. We poured a lot of diplomatic effort into Arab-Israeli peace, which, sure. you know, a lot of it seems like wasted, um, like wasted effort. You know, should our posture now essentially be one of trying to disentangle ourselves as much as possible from the Middle East? I wouldn't say, well, if it's from the Israeli-Palestinian issue, I would say I don't think any Secretary of State should devote a significant, I don't think the case is there to devote a significant chunk of your time. Ever since Henry Kissinger, this has become kind of the, the great test of a secretary of state it's uh he had certain strategic openings to use my favorite word certain situations were ripe for diplomatic initiative many of his successors tried to jam it when the sit when the situation was not right and i think that was a poor use of their uh calories i would say our goal with the israeli palestinian issue right now ought to be to keep open possibilities so if and when hopefully when but certainly you know if the stars begin to align inside of Israel and in the Palestinian areas, then the, uh, the options are there if people are willing to avail themselves of. What I think we want to do is discourage action like annexation that closes off avenues down the road. But I wouldn't spend a lot of time trying to force uh, a process forward when the situation, the prerequisites simply, simply aren't there. You know, more broadly, strategic withdrawal from the Middle East, uh, the danger is not just Iranian nuclearization, but the nuclearization of Saudi, Turkey, Egypt, and so forth. So uh, it's not a, it's, if you think the Middle East is bad now, imagine that Middle East. Well, okay, so let me press you on that one. Do you really think it's going to be uh, possible to prevent a nuclearized Iran? Yes, but difficult, yes, but possible. But I'm not, I don't think we can probably do it through negotiations alone. I certainly don't think we can do it through the JCPOA. JCPOA, Iran could re-enter it. So just for everybody who's listening, the JCPOA was the agreement oh. negotiated under the Obama administration with yes. a whole bunch of complicated provisions. Right. But go ahead. Yeah. yeah, 2015 agreement. The problem with the agreement is over time, some of its restraints begin to go away. And in the course of the agreement, Iran can be in full compliance yet have dramatically reduced the amount of time it would need to go towards a nuclear weapon. Essentially, by the end of the agreement, 
in say 15 years or so, though some aspects of the agreement went longer, but the principal aspects of the agreement were now 10 years from now, Iran could be in compliance with the agreement, yet be 90% of the way there in terms of many of the, the capabilities it would need. And even President Obama acknowledged that in an interview once, that the amount of warning time the agreement would leave would, would, would be gradually reduced as it was uh, implemented. So either you had to believe in two things. One is that Iran, during the course of this agreement, would fundamentally transform. It would become Switzerland in the desert. And you like that idea. Or you would have to uh, think that you could come on with a follow-on agreement, what's now known as the longer, stronger uh, agreement. Uh, I certainly don't see grounds for the former. That sounds like a, a wish, not a strategy. Uh, the latter also sounds a bit like a wish, not a, a, a strategy. So I have, uh, I have my doubts. Uh, so yeah, I think there are with ways, it's a much longer conversation, but I would essentially, uh, have certain understandings with Iran about the limits and that we would give them certain incentives to abide by those understandings and certain, shall we say, disincentives were they to cross them. And that could require selective action, by the way. I think that's become Israel's policy. I think what you're seeing from Israel with these various attacks is a, is a form of a selective action, which is trying to keep a de, a de facto ceiling on Iranian uh, capabilities. Yeah, I mean, there's an even larger question there. I mean, the Israelis and the Iranians have been waging this low-level war against each other, which is, and you can argue this is now not just there, but you look at, uh, say, what the Russians are doing in the Ukraine. You have a number of these kind of low-level wars bubbling along. That's a whole separate conversation. We don't have time. I always let people out five minutes early, so we're, we've only got a few minutes left. Let me ask one... I'm going to interrupt for one second, though. You should write about that, I think, or someone, one of your students should. This question of the blurring of lines between war and non-war, particularly with cyber and some of these other things going on, and the Israeli-Iranian relationships, a really interesting test case of it. It's getting harder and harder to describe what, where we are and harder and harder to structure it in ways that there are clear thresholds. And without that, very hard to deter. So I just think we've entered a, an area where in some ways the field has not caught up with the reality. I completely agree with that. I mean, you know, even, you know, it's sort of like a mi relatively minor technical area. The fact that outfits like ISIS can have a fleet of drones that they can actually use, you know, to, uh, to attack base camps. And, uh, well, that's pretty incredible. Or if you look at, uh, say, you know, the Turks versus the Russians in uh, uh, Libya or the Azerbaijan war, I mean, you're dealing with, conflicts which look quite different than they did in the past. I, I agree with you. It's, um, it's a big, interesting, and uh, challenging issue. So the last, but the last big issue I wanted to raise with you. So we have a question from Gustavo Salzedo. Do you think that the Road and Belt Initiative threatens Russian, uh, the Russian position in Central Asia? Do you see Russia ever coming around and joining the West in containing China? And what I want, let me kind of focus on that one in particular. So, you know, from a master of rail politic like yourself, I would expect, uh, uh, you know, saying, look, the great card to play here is the natural antagonism or what should be a natural antagonism between Russia and China. We, you know, we don't have a long land border with Russia. The Russians have a long land border with China. There are territorial disputes. There are, there are you know, manifest demographic pressures uh, you know, there's, the, you know, unfortunately, there's kind of a deep racist piece to it. But in any case, all the pieces are on the table, one would think, uh, to drive a wedge between Russia and China. And yet, if you look at what's going on in the world, the Russians seem to be getting closer to the Chinese rather than the other way around. So could you ruminate on that? Happy to ruminate, but I'm going to surprise you at the end of my answer. Yeah, I think at the moment between Russia and China, you've got a bit of a mariage de convenience that they're, they both see the liberalism, democracy promoting, whatever you want to call the West these days, uh, as a threat. Uh, they're both illiberal. They have that in, in common and so forth. But I wouldn't exaggerate what they have in common. Everything you said is true. That There's a lot of structural reasons why I think the long-term relationship between Russia and China is uneasy and is not necessarily 
complementary. I don't think there's anything we can do, though, to exploit that or develop that under Putin uh, to zero. So the real question is what happens the day after? And I don't know if that day is in 20. Yeah, basically Putin, as Bob Gates once said, Putin's going to only be leave power feet first. So I don't know, you know when that is. And he's staying now, he said, till 2036. If he's still alive, he'll stay, long, he'll stay longer. I mean, one way or another, he's, uh, he, he's going to look after it. The question is what happens after? And one of the cardinal features of a system like this, the Russian system, and in a funny sort of way now, the Chinese system a little bit under Xi Jinping, because he's, he's just by ab abolishing term limits he, and abolishing collective leadership, he has actually challenged some of the basics of the, of the system, is you've raised real questions now about succession and legitimacy and order. And particularly, uh, but in both countries, but particularly in Russia. Uh, I'm not confident sitting here about what Russia is going to look like after Putin. What's that process going to look like? Uh, I can't imagine someone else being able to simply step into his shoes and take over. Uh, and so the question then is, what happens? Is there a struggle for power? How violent does it get? Could go through several phases. I don't think, um, I don't think this Russia, Putin's Russia is permanent. I'm just not smart enough to what comes afterwards, but I think it could be messy. And I think it could involve some very powerful centrifugal tendencies within that uh, country, just given the demographics. And China, again, depending upon how long Xi Jinping uh, stays in power, how it's institutionalized, how, what kind of provisions are made for succession, I think he's, he's raised certain doubts. No, I think China has much stronger collective leadership still in institutions. It's still an institutional country. It's the party store. You got 90, 95 million people in the party. Russia, that's gone. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a kleptocracy. It's personal. So I think China's continuity is a far, far greater likelihood than Russia's. But I think the question of uh, Russia after Putin is a bit in play. I think, I think people in our field underestimate uh, that. And as a result, I think the Chinese-Russian relationship, I don't make a lot of assumptions, but I'll be honest with you. I worry about a lot of stuff. I'm a default worrier. Uh, that's not high on my list, uh, the idea of the two of them. Now, whether there's actually a positive thing for us there one day, maybe, but that's such a fundamentally different Russia. Uh, but we ought not to rule it out, and we ought not to ultimately try to engage Russia in certain ways to try to move it, to make it more European in certain ways. Uh, one of the reasons people like me had certain doubts about NATO enlargement, uh, and I was pretty uh, comfortable with other arrangements including the partnership for peace. Uh, I thought we could have gotten a lot of what we wanted without some of the, 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 the cost. But, but I think Russia is an interesting case in, 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 the, in the long run. Yeah. Well, this was a great conversation. We could have gone on for hours. I wish I could have hosted you here in person, but when we just do dinner sometime and, you know, when the fog lifts and uh, either I'm in New York or you're in DC. This is terrific. Thank Thanks so much, Richard. Take care Thank now. Thank you.